Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another Whiskey and Wicks brought to you by Mind Digital, Australia's newest and best digital asset exchange. In this show, we talk with the best traders around, we discuss everything markets from beginners to experts. Uh, as always, nothing you hear here is financial advice. Please don't take it as such. Please do your own research. Uh, during session, any questions, you can click the raise hand button and I'll put you on so you can ask your question or click on the Q&A button if you prefer to type at the bottom. And it should let you ask questions there, and we'll answer it as soon as we can. So, without further ado, let's get started with the panel. Uh, Grant, would you like to get started first? Introduce yourself. Thank you, Dr. Greg. Uh, Grant Colthorpe, CEO of My Digital, um, regular on Whiskey Mix, and happy to be here again. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. Tony. Yep, Tony Sycamore, first-time panelists, and uh, happy to join you, gentlemen. I am the CEO and founder of an advisory firm called TechFX Traders. Thanks, uh, Tony. So, okay, let's just dig into session. So, Tony was referred to me here by a lot of the good traders that we've had here, uh, Greeny, Matt. Uh, so, let's dig a bit into you, Tony. I'd like to learn more about you and where you got into trading. When did you start trading? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my story is, is a long one. I've been around for a while now. I started back in the mid-1990s as a bond broker on a bond broking desk in Sydney. And one of the, one of the things about bond broking at that particular time, it was very, very intensive around uh, the entertainment side of the business and not so much around learning about financial markets. And my interest was in learning about financial markets. I enjoyed a beer, don't get me wrong, but that was a bit more secondary to me. And I took the opportunity to move from the bond breaking desk to take a job down on the floor of the Sydney Futures Exchange, which was the open outcry system where you used to see all of us bods with uh, colourful jackets yelling and screaming at each other and learned a lot about markets, had uh, made some good friends down there. But most of all, it was just really for me about learning how markets worked, what drove markets. And we could see it every day. We could smell it every day. We could hear it every day. You know, the fear, the greed, the emotion that was almost excreting out of the pores of the floor of the Sydney Futures Exchange were right there before us. So a wonderful, wonderful spot to learn about markets. And I'd always had an interest in trading. Um, I, I remember thinking back very early that I wanted to get involved in trading and, and that was a great spot to learn. My next step was to go out and do some trading for myself. And I realized that the electronic system of trading that we now have in place was going to be the dominant force in the next X amount of years. So the open outcry system, there was a lot of guys down there on the futures floor making very, very good money. But I realized that their time was limited in some respect as the technological changes came through the industry. So I decided to start trading. Uh, if you will, I was like a local or a private trader, much like you or I are now, trading from home in front of a screen. And I wanted to learn how to trade from screens and for the first six months of that experience it was a wonderful wonderful journey i was really in tune with the markets i found that it was very very easy to make money um, but what came next sort of taught me a pretty good life lesson about trading and i'm sure many of your listeners will be able to relate to this the actual making of money was relatively easy but keeping hold of that money proved to be a difficult proposition so after six months i started giving back what we call, what Grant will know, we call it donating to the market. So the money which I'd made, I was donating back to the market. And it became apparent to me that I probably didn't quite know just enough to be out there on my own. I was still in my early 20s. So I took a job at, uh, a, on a private futures desk, a private trader futures desk, at an old Melbourne stockbroking firm called JB Weir. Now, for many of the newer uh, types in the market, they won't have heard of JB Weir. JB Weir was a very old Melbourne stockbroking firm, been around over 100 and I think 75 years uh, at this point of time. JB Weir has been reincarnated, but it soon became uh, the second partner in a in a fairly subservient marriage, if you like, to Goldman Sachs and. One of the things we're doing on the private trader futures desk, we were trading all types of markets for our clients. We were trading cocoa, sugar, wheat, coffee, DAX, SPY, you name it, S&P, gold, oil. We we're across all of those markets, but we we're also trading a retail futures fund. And the retail futures fund was doing very, very well. And when Goldman Sachs started running their ruler over the business, 
they came across myself and my boss who was trading the retail futures fund. And don't get me wrong, we were very much more secondary. Goldman Sachs bought the business for the distribution arm that JB Weir offered across the stockbroking platform here in Australia. But when they got to our area, they looked and said, well, look, you guys can obviously make money. Um, we're Goldman Sachs. We don't like people or our employees risking our clients' money, but we would like you to risk some of our money for us. And we were absolutely thrilled. They sent us off to the proprietary trading room. This was around 2003. And just being around uh, you know, some of the, the best traders in Australia, some of the best macro traders, stock traders, relative value traders, credit traders, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I was there as part of the proprietary trading room for six years, right up and through the global financial crisis, which obviously has um, some it resonates to a lot of people now that have been through the COVID crash can obviously uh, draw some experiences back from that time around the GFC. And I had a good time during the GFC. I don't want to make light of it because it was a very serious action. But in terms of uh, my trading, it was, a, it was a good time for me to be trading. We were making good money. Um, but one of the things that came about from the GFC was the increased rules and regulations the Volcker rule, Dodd-Frank rule, which basically outlawed proprietary trading at big banks. So to cut a long story short, um, I was let go at, uh, from Goldman Sachs on March the 6th, 2009. And someone like Grant will probably know that was the very low of the S&P, the low of the S&P, uh, 666, the devil's number. I probably should have known what was going to happen that day when I walked into the office because I'd seen quite a few of my colleagues being let go already. We had the Bear Stearns, we had the Lehmans, and then you know the, the trading room, which was probably 25, 26 traders at the very start, was down to probably 15, 14 traders. And uh, my turn came around and, and I left proprietary trading at that point of time. I moved into a foreign exchange institutional sales role because where I'd made my money trading at Goldman Sachs was effectively in the foreign exchange market. Um, I'd traded stock indices, I'd traded commodities, but I'd found that really where I was making money, my trading style was very, very suited to foreign exchange. And I took those skills, if you like, into an institutional sales role. I was at BNP Paribas for a couple of years, Commonwealth Bank of Australia for a couple of years, uh, for about five years. And here I am today. I'm now uh, started my own, as I mentioned, an advisory firm. We do market analysis, technical analysis, trader education, and, and we also trade ourselves. So, you know, wearing many, many hats at this point of time, but that's, I guess, the snapshot of the journey which has me here today. Okay, that, that's, that's a very colourful story. <laughs> yeah. I tried to give you the short version. Sorry if it went on a bit long. And sorry for see, anyone that's heard that. I agree. No, that, that was pretty... I see Grant smiles every now and then. Yes. Uh, I think he was relating with a few things you were saying. reminding him of funny moments, I assume. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so one thing... I'm mean, just one thing on what you just said is you said they banned the big banks from prop, prop trading. Why'd they do that? Well, that was one of the, 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 the causes of the GFC was seen to be the leverage that banks were taking. Now, in proprietary trading, um, that wasn't really the problem. The problem was obviously the, the subprime, the, the, you know, the, the basically credit, what was going on there in the housing market and the credit market. Prop trading was a very small part of bank leverage, but everything that, if you recall, the banks were bailed out by the Fed. And as part of the Fed handing over their cash, which we're seeing a lot of right now, the rules around what banks could do changed. And one of the stipulations from the Fed uh, was that banks could no longer, if you, were, if you were a bank and you were receiving the government's money, you certainly couldn't go and then give it to a team of proprietary traders to risk that money in the market. So effectively, proprietary trading at big banks was closed down. And Back then, it was you know, every bank had a proprietary trading desk, all trading the bank's capital. Nowadays, what happens is that most of those guys trading the bank's capital sit on the treasury desks or the balance sheet of the big banks, or they've moved on to the big hedge funds around the world. And unfortunately for me, my P&L was, uh, in terms of the capital I had, it was a good performance. But my, if you want to go and work for a big hedge fund on, on New York or in London, um, with, with an offshoot, say, in Singapore, you've got to be making considerable amounts of money. And I wasn't, unfortunately, in that league at that stage. So while I probably would have considered um, 
well, I, I would have liked to have had that opportunity. It wasn't available to me because, you know, they were looking for guys who were making 10, 20, 30 million dollars and I wasn't quite there yet. Okay. And the funniest oh. part on it, though, was that the follow up was when they all got banned from doing it. Uh, the genius that he is, Jamie Dimon, just ignored it and continued to prop trade for another three years until he completely blew up. Um, so there was a famous trade called the London <laughs> Whale where. JP Morgan just ran a massive credit position and got found out and, and lost billions of dollars. And, and Jamie, being the guy that he is, just sort of said, oh, sorry, we're naughty boys, just let us go. And, you know, because he's the most powerful bank in the world, he was allowed to go. And, and you know, and then, then just continued to do as he pleased. But, uh, yeah, for most of the other banks, it was just it was a good night. Yeah, it was good night or put it underneath, uh, put it somewhere where it couldn't be found. Like I said, put it on the balance sheet desk or on the mm-hmm. treasury desk. And still in this day and age, I can assure you there's banks taking risk with the bank's money, but it's not proprietary trading. And in a lot of banks, you've got to imagine there, you've got to keep in mind that there was already balance sheet traders. There was already treasury traders. So there was a real surplus of traders floating around during mm-hmm. that time. It's pretty, I find this pretty interesting. The more I've been doing this show, the more I get to talk to professional traders, institutional traders, the more I realize that while we thought that in crypto, we had the Wild West, you guys had a much, it seems like the Wild West you guys had back then was a lot more entertaining than what we think is a Wild West. (laughs) Yes, yeah. Now, there were some interesting times back then, but it wasn't Wild West. And I think sometimes, look, there was certainly cowboys out there, as um, Grant mentioned, the the, the whale there was definitely a big player. And we could go back anecdotally and look at some of the big players which famously blew up probably all the way back to the Hunt brothers. You know, they they were probably in the silver market. But there's been some big blow-ups in there. But in terms of where we were sitting and and most of your prop traders at banks, they were good traders. They were making money. And it's thought that at one point of time, the proprietary trading room at Goldman Sachs in Sydney was actually keeping the whole business solvent. So, you know, sometimes we get a bit of a bad rap. Yeah, you guys are cowboys. You're doing this, you're doing that. You know, you lose 20 million, you make 20 million. But we made good money for the bank during that period. And I think a lot of proprietary traders did because, you know, what happened back then, it basically unfolded over 16 months. You know, we saw the magnitudes of the moves like we saw in March and April, which unfolded over two months. They took 16 months to play out. So if there is a difference between the market now and the market back then in terms of the movement, in that sell-off, it was just the speed of the movement in March was so much faster, which was a good and a bad thing. It meant that you had to be able to get on board and make your money in March and April because it just, you know, the rebound was quite savage. Whereas during the GFC, you know, that was a very protracted, long drawn out period before the Fed and before the other central banks stepped in and really stemmed the bleeding Um, there was, you know, there was some good trends in place and they lasted for months and months and months. Here we are, fast forward to 2020 and the downtrend lasted the better part of six weeks and that was it. Yeah, I mean, that that in itself was an interesting part. I mean, that that deserves to be spoken about a bit. I mean, you mentioned the whole printing and all that. I mean, well, how do you feel about what's happening in the market right now? Do you think what's happening is natural? What's, I mean, two parts of it would be the US dollar and the S&P. What? Oh, look, firstly on the S&P, I mean, the S&P, I wasn't surprised that the S&P ra- rallied. Um, in fact, you know, most of the analysis we were putting out there suggested, I think the, the, from the 26th of March, we called a bottom and said we're going to see a 20, 30% rally. Um, so we, we liked that part of the movement. The next 20 or 30%, Let's be honest, we weren't expecting that to happen quite so quickly, but progressively we've seen more and more of this money printing, this central bank action and activity. So, you know, you've got to sort of look at it and think, well, okay, as the facts change, so do my views. So I've learned from the GFC when the real when the Fed really wants to step up and stem the bleed, they can and they will do it. And we've seen that. And, you know, we've seen for the last three weeks of June that the market would sell off into the end of the week. We've seen this sell off Thursday, Friday, people very nervous about holding longs. Um, But that's the great time. You know, we've seen the Fed come out and make quite a few announcements on a Friday 
or on, a, on the following Monday morning, and the market's just snapped back. So there is a real determination there by, I think, the Fed to, to keep the markets where they want them. A lot of bad news has been thrown at equity markets in the past couple of weeks, and they haven't gone down. They've snapped right back from any little sell-off they've had. And I often come back to some simple sayings, which I learned during my time at Goldman's and, and before that, that you know, when, when you've got a market that isn't going down with bad news, potentially that's a pretty good sign that it's going to go higher. And when you think about, right, 4th of July, long weekend, a very patriotic time for all Americans, um, you know, maybe we see a little bit of a wobble into the, the jobs number on Thursday. It's got the potential to be a very big surprise because actually accurately forecasting this number is going to be very, very difficult just because of the scale of job losses. So let's say we get a positive or negative surprise and one way or the other, the market rocks and rolls. No one wants to be long into the long weekend. But my thoughts are that by Monday, 4th of July holiday long weekend, very patriotic time. Market hasn't been able to go down after the last three, two to three weeks. I think we probably can look to July, at least the first few weeks of July has been, I'm starting to think now the risk is to the upside. We've, we've tried the downside, hasn't wanted to go down. To me, the risk now is looking like, well, these guys are throwing a lot at it and it hasn't gone down, potentially trying to keep a, a balloon underwater. Maybe that balloon just wants to try and float to the surface over the next three or four weeks. Well, the other interesting thing is obviously then you're moving into summer, which is always will get thin in the US and, and Europe. And as we know, when markets get thin, they, they can do you know, things that are a little bit more unexpected. Uh, trends tend to be more persistent in thin markets. So... You know, as you said, Tony, if we can sort of limp it, if it probably limps its way into a, a semi-uptrend into the first week of July, everyone starts going on holiday, and by the end of July and August, everyone's fully on holiday, well, That's right. you know, the markets are going to probably, you know, do that. But I guess the only thing, and this becomes an interesting trade, you know, and I know something it's, you know, obviously you follow Tony closely and obviously, uh, you know, one of your very close mates is obviously... And Josh, you know, Green as well, into vol trading as it becomes an interesting play where if we continue to see this collapse in, in volatility leading into the say the summer period, but we have that spectre of there being some unexpected news, it sort of bodes well to probably be long vol at cheap levels, you know, into these into this summer period. And, you know, interestingly enough, Bitcoin at the moment's probably a great example of it. I mean it's you know, IVs are trading at the money at around 50%. You, you'd call the mean IV in Bitcoin normally 75 to 80. So yeah. it's trading well below mean levels. And, you know, from a point of view, that you know, for listeners out there, if you're long volatility, essentially you don't have to take, you know, a position on the market or a viewpoint on which the market's going to go up or down. It's going to benefit if it wings around. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at that type of trade if we go into July, you know, get through July and the, the range is still contracting or it's quite small and the market, as I said, gets in the summer and it's likely to thin out. Yeah, and, and you know, I worked at, I think I mentioned I worked at BNP Paribas, French bank, and I know that from working there, if you sent an email at the start of July to head office, you wouldn't get an answer until mid-August. So yeah. you're absolutely right. The volumes do drop off. The Europeans, for them, it's their Christmas period. Not only that, they've had a pretty tough start to the year. They've been locked down. Um, the weather's finding up. We saw what happened at the beach. At, was it Brighton or Bournemouth or something? Those pictures yeah. back from the UK last weekend. So they're stinging to get out. So I think you're probably going to see the Europeans just say, look, this has been a crap start of the year. I'm off on holidays and I'll take a little bit of a look at things when I get back. In the US, well, they're probably going the other way a little bit, to be honest. So, you know, as you said, there's probably a good reason to have a little bit of volatility on the books, um, own some vol. I, you know, I, I always try and stay out of these end of months and end of financial years and end of quarter roll off. So I've been square for the last couple of days. I don't, you know, I'll start to look at it again after this July 4th uh, holiday. But yeah, I, I do have sympathy with, with what you're saying there. Pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, if the French yeah, like a holiday, that's for sure. So yeah. they're, yeah. maybe that's <laughs> more extreme than the other. You know, certainly the Germans are a little uh, more, in, I guess, industrious in that area. But yeah, the French, once they, they clock off in early July, you don't hear from them again until mid August. <laughs> hey, it's hard doing a 38 hour week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, 
I love how you just justified the way the market. I mean, I've been thinking about the way the S and P is going up as completely irrational, and you just justified it as being, as the Fed propping it up being normal. Is that acceptable? Well, we said don't, don't, before, don't you think yeah. that can end badly? Doesn't doesn't that concern you seeing the GFC that I could end very very badly? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're kicking the can down the road. At some point of time, <laughs> this is an um, this, what's going on now is an experiment, isn't it? And I remember speaking at a conference a couple of years ago and a few of the delegates there were saying, what's your view on MMT and, and, and where the way things are going? And I must be honest, I didn't think it was going to happen. Yeah. You know, it, you know people were talking about it. There'd been uh, some papers written on it, but it wasn't until this crisis, and this isn't a financial crisis, this is a humanitarian crisis, as we know. So unusual happenings call for unusual remedies and... Um, you know they've been they've been very proactive, and and I know that fixing Wall Street doesn't fix Main Street, and it doesn't make coronavirus go away, and it doesn't make a vaccine any closer, but it buys them time. Now, the question you asked is, how does it all end? I don't think anyone knows. I don't think anyone knows, Omar. It's it's hopefully uh, you know it's not in the next few years. Maybe it's another <laughs> five or six years down the road. But you know, Bitcoin obviously speaks. Uh, you know, its its values and its attributes speak out very strongly about why or, or, or here I am, you know, in this un you know, un I guess uncertain yeah. times the right word. You know, there's good reasons to own Bitcoin. We've been, you know, very strategically bullish gold. That's where I've made a good chunk of my money at the start of the year. Um you know, tactically trying to trade it is is, you know, again I was a little bit worried about the equities selling off and like we saw in March. And this was something which uh, Bitcoin traders would relate to as well. Everything just got liquidated in March. It didn't matter whether you're looking at gold, Bitcoin, or the S&P. It was just a wholesale liquidation move. And, and to be honest, that caught me in Bitcoin a little bit as well. That was the last time that I traded Bitcoin. I'd had some wonderful trades in Bitcoin, but um, I was surprised, not so much surprised by the risk off. We've seen this sort of liquidation, this position wash before. Um, what surprised me was when it actually happened because I was trading Bitcoin through an ETF and I'm not supposed to say that. I know I'm on a mine presentation here, but I was trading it through an ETF on a European exchange and the European exchange was closed when Bitcoin went through my stop loss. So I'm very disciplined. Um, I know a lot of people are buying Bitcoin because of its longer term properties. Uh, for me, Bitcoin doesn't matter what I'm looking at. I treat it the same way. I manage my risk. Uh, I have a view. And if my view isn't proved correct this time, I'll have a look at it again at another point of time. So my view was proved incorrect at that point of time. And my stop loss in Bitcoin was about 8,000. And obviously Bitcoin, well, we, we saw the, 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 Swiss, the Swiss sell-off and the rebound. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of that sell-off actually occurred uh, when, when the market that I was trading was closed. Now, that's a wonderful endorsement for, for mine exchange because, you know, the markets there is always open. And um, if you are more of a mindset than I am when you're trading and you need to be able to get in and get out, that's what you need to be able to do. Uh, that's, that's an interesting thing you did bring up, an interesting point over there that a lot of the people listening to this show are generally new people, new traders. They're trying to learn how to trade. And that's something that it took me years to actually understand that to be able to trade myself is that even though I'm long-term bullish on Bitcoin, when I look at the chart and I'm being a trader, I need to trade. It's not about where I think the price Correct. is going to be in 10 years. I need yeah. to know when to get in, when to get out. That's the trade. And that's Spot it. Spot on. Spot on. Yeah. And, yes. and that's the lesson. I hadn't been, I'd probably had maybe half a dozen good trades in Bitcoin. I think I'd had, you know, I think two losing trades and I'd been able to stop out. Um, but overwhelmingly, my Bitcoin trades had made some very good money. But this one particular instance, I just I couldn't manage my risk on it. And that was a yeah. very big, I guess, black mark against the way I was trading Bitcoin. Not against Bitcoin at all, because every asset class came under pressure at that point of time. It was just I couldn't get out because Bitcoin trades seven days a week. And the ETF that I'm trading is only available during European hours five days a week. So. I now have to look at um, more liquid type options if I'm going to trade Bitcoin. I think it's an interesting point though you raise there, Tony, and, and it's something that you know you, you've had experience with and, and it's happened in, you think about in the FX markets, like when the Swiss franc broke against the euro, right? Again, it was, it was super important 
you know, ultimately it was where you, which broker you're using. Some brokers were really good and you're able to execute orders during that period and, and you know, potentially you, your risk was honoured and, you know, things like that. And then other, you know, lower quality brokers, it was, you know, too bad, so sad, they just froze the market and you, you couldn't act and do anything, you know. And it is, a, I think, as, as Omar said, you know, this is, a lot of the, the listeners this are newer traders and I think it really comes back to, you know, the importance of, you know, doing your due diligence on the platforms you're using, understanding the limitations 100%. of them all. Like all platforms will have limitations, right? It doesn't matter how good or great they are. Um, everyone has one or a couple or, or several. But, you know, you need to understand what you're doing at all times. Um, and it is, I think it's one of the easy things to, to gloss over. Like a great example for me, I remember I was a really active CFD trader when I was young. And then, you know, went to a professional trading house. So, you know, I'm not going to bother trading CFDs when I can just trade at work. And then I remember I got back into them. And for the first week, I kept putting all these positions on. And I'm like, why is my funding cost so high? And essentially, the, the default wasn't to, to actually reduce the position. It was just to put on offsetting positions. And as we know, the funding cost is a spread and essentially you're paying the high spread on the long positions and you're paying, you know, you're receiving no interest on your short positions. And essentially I was just running an increasingly long and short position. It wasn't reducing it ever. It was just costing me more and more money on financing. And, yes. and by the time I realised, I think over that, you know, over the two-week period, I, I probably lost, I'd probably lost $1,500 on financing yeah, yeah. By, by doing that. And, and again, it was one of those really simple things. I didn't... I didn't check the fact that it just said reduce as an order type. If I would have ticked that, it would have reduced me on all those and, and you wouldn't have had that issue. You know, it is, I think it's really important for whether you're using MT4, whether you use NinjaTrader or CQG or TT or, you know, the native um, platform offered by the various crypto exchanges to make sure you're comfortable and understand what you're doing with them. Um, you know, we, we've had, we had a, a user recently, which was quite lucky because we were the counterparty to the trade. Um, they put the, they put the price in for the quantity and the quantity into the price and then he oh. traded and, you know, for them, they would have lost oh. you know, circa about 10 grand. Yeah, and right. it was just sort of, we just said to them, look, you know, we know who you are. We, we want you to be a long-term customer. So we're just going to reverse the trade. For what you the trade yeah. Yeah. You can have your, you can have your money back, but um, yeah, that happens. And there's a lot of there's a lot of other places out there that would never reverse that trade. Oh no, no, no! I mean, you, you guys are good guys, but you could definitely, if that was someone else, they would have just lost that money. Um, yeah. And to be fair, I'm not having a crack at any broker. I got two two trading accounts, um, and it had nothing to do with the broker. In my instance, yeah. it was just the fact that um, you know I'd wandered into the Bitcoin space a couple of years ago when foreign exchange volatility dried uh, dried up in some respects and I saw Bitcoin moving and for a trader, you know, you go where the markets are moving. Mm -hmm. I did my research on Bitcoin. I liked the story. I like, you know, I, I thought for me, I look at how many cryptocurrencies are out there and I think we've got what 1600 cryptocurrencies at the moment. And I remember back to the tech wreck, you know, it didn't matter um, what particular stocks you're holding. Um, as long as you're holding, I think it was eBay and Amazon. They were the two that survived. Yeah. And I thought, well, I remember that time particularly well. And for me, if there's going to be one that I just want to tr focus on um, where the volume is, I don't know which of those 1,600 cryptocurrencies, maybe it'll be half a dozen, maybe it'll be a dozen. I don't know. I don't know which ones will be around in two years' time or three years' time. So I just focused on Bitcoin and it was moving and it was in comparison to FX there and moving in, in a tradable market for me. So I... I you know, I had some good trades in it, but I hadn't ever had the problem before where I needed to get a stop loss filled in the weekend. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was a new thing for me. Unfortunately, it happened right when, you know, it dropped from whatever yeah. it was. I think I was 9,200 to 3,850 and, and all the way back up again. So on, on that, Tony, I guess, as a, to steal I was stunned for one second, is do you think... Uh, Bitcoin especially is going to be something that other FX traders are going to move into and are, and are looking at given the fact that, you know, FX has been a pretty hard game now for, what, several years? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's... I look at where markets are moving, where there's opportunities to trade. Um, 
you know, and exchanges effectively, exchanges want to see price movement. Traders want to see price movement and a little bit like a moth to a flame, by definition, traders go where there's price movement. And I think Bitcoin is probably just doing what it needs to do at the moment. It needs to become a little bit more stable for some of the attributes and claims of the product to actually, you know, this is a good store of money. But if you're seeing your store of money go up and down 20% every day, that sort of undermines the validity of the product. So I think, yes, other products are moving at the moment and maybe Bitcoin's a little bit stationary, but I think that's probably a good thing in the longer term. Um, The longer term story behind Bitcoin, I think is a very good story, but I think it's going to need to see some movement to get, I think some interest again because right now people are looking at things like gold. You know, gold's probably the hot spot right now. Silver, if silver breaks up, um, you know, equities, people just look at it and shake their head and go, I can't buy it, I can't sell it. Foreign exchange, I think, has been reasonably good for the last probably, well, last six months. Um, yeah. It certainly had a bit of a quiet period into the end of 2019, but I think right now there's enough movement out there to keep people interested. And it probably allows Bitcoin to cement some of its status behind what it's meant to be. I look at charts a lot. So when I trade, um, and this probably goes back to my futures floor days, I I start, I look at charts as a bit of a probability framework where I can risk some money with, you know, an acceptable capital exposure and where there's good upside in a trade. And, And that's my overriding arching, if you like, determine whether I get into it or out of a trade. Behind that, so... I'm probably 60% technical. I'm probably 30 to 40% macro. So I look at the story. I like the story behind Bitcoin. But for me now, to really get those guys buzzing again and people talking about it, I think there's some really clear points on the charts. And and you look at the year-to-date heights, year-to-date highs up around 10,500. Mm. Uh, I think we got up to 10,492. What was it? Four weeks ago. And yeah. it's backed off from there. It's back sitting around 9,000. Um, there's also a very... Uh, dominant weekly trend line coming in at Bitcoin from the 13,880 high, which I think was June last year. Yeah, and it well, picks up uh, another high and that comes in around 11,000. So for me, there's a bit of resistance sitting there around that 10,500 to 11,000 area. And while Bitcoin's below there, it's consolidating. It's doing what it needs to do. It's rebuilding the energy. Sure, it's not moving when everything else is rocking and rolling, but I think that's a good thing because it, in some ways it, it erases some of those doubts which emerged back in March. But to get that right, we're going to 15,000 or we're going to 20,000. And for me to get actively involved back in the market, I need to see either a break of that 10, 5, 11,000 resistance area or I want to see a pullback towards a 200-day moving average maybe 8,300. We saw a lot of lows around 8,600, 8,100. Somewhere into that support area probably looks where to me, I'm a longer-term trader. I'm not a short-term trader. 7,800, 7,600. So that looks like the value zone for me, yeah. Yeah. Huh, I didn't know you actually traded Bitcoin, so that's... No, I do, I do. And I yeah, I actually didn't know that. <laughs> you know, I think as well if we come back to some of the, you know, I... I, I teach um as i mentioned i teach trading for for a broker and you know we look at some of these famous the godfathers of macro trading which you probably have seen your paul tudor jones your bruce kovner's you know your bill lipschutz's and you know bill lipschutz is very famous for saying that the, one of the biggest things about trading is being patient 50 percent of your time trading is being patient and i think one of the things which new traders and i would you know, I'd reiterate this to you just mentioned there's a lot of new traders out there um, and this isn't trading advice. You said that as well. Um, but there is three positions in the market. You can be long, you can be short and you can be square. And that's patience. That's waiting for the opportunities to emerge. And there will be opportunities in all markets. It's just a matter of being patient and waiting. So, yep, sure, Bitcoin might not be whizzing around now, but 12 months ago, FX was doing nothing and Bitcoin Mm. was moving around quite nicely. So it's about being patient, waiting for the opportunities. And yeah, I look look at it, Omar. I mean, I'm very interested in it. I like the the story behind it. Um, I don't have enough time to spend looking at the other 1,599 cryptocurrencies, but I still don't matter anyway. Three or four. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, it's actually another interesting point. A lot of of the best 
Bitcoin traders out there, best crypto traders out there that I know at least, because crypto has been moving in a, what, yeah, as you said, it's no trade zone, no one knows what's happening. A lot of them have switched over to trading effects now. You're I right. mean, Cloud Juice, Trader Main last yeah. week, they've all said, like, we just can't trade Bitcoin anymore because we, until it breaks that 10.5 or until it goes down, we don't know what's happening. Yeah. So we're just going to trade FX instead. And a lot of them have yeah. been telling me that I should start doing that because FX is easier for them to trade because the market actually closes. Yes. Well, that's, and that's a great yeah. thing as well. <laughs> and I look back and I think I told you, you know, the, starting out in the futures floor and, and then moving into proprietary trading, if I had my time again, um, I probably wouldn't have proprietary traded futures and FX. I would have just proprietary traded single name stocks because the stock boys, you know, they, they wheel in at nine o'clock, the market <laughs> opens at 9.50 and they, they're out the door again at 4.15. Whereas, you know, F, FX traders and the crypto traders, you know, there's not much chance to really, you know, see that break, which these guys get e each and every day because the market is whizzing around 24 hours a day. For you guys, it's seven days a week. For me, it's five days a week, but, it can mean that if you're not disciplined and you've got your risk structure in place, that it can lead to a lot of sleep deprivation. And uh, as Grant knows, sleep deprivation isn't a big thing on my agenda. I like to sleep well now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I like yeah, to put say so. Beautiful time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, well, that's, that's kind of the way I'm seeing things anyway. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned you said you do trader education. So trader education as in retail traders or do you teach professional traders how to trade? What's yeah, it's, it's basically for um, private traders. So retail traders. Uh, I started my tech effects traders business with the idea of bringing the technical analysis. So I was writing a technical report at CBA and I did it at BNP. And before that, I was doing it for the Goldman Sachs macro because I was, just love charts. I love looking at charts. I'm very visual. You know, I like hearing a good story, but I like seeing the evidence in front of me. And, and it really resonated with me as well, you know, thinking about um, the risk reward that you can get. Like, I, I know a lot of great macro traders, um, but they're even leaning against charts to safeguard their views you know, you sort of think, well, where's my view wrong that the S&P shouldn't be going higher? And, you know, if the reasons they've put on a short S&P trade are still valid. Well, we've got surging coronavirus cases. We've got uh, an economy which is, you know, on death doorsteps. You know, nothing's changed for them, but price is the yeah. arbiter. And, you know, that's why I like my technicals. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big one. Um, but, yes, they're private trader educational courses. They're based around technicals um, i bring in some macro stuff but overwhelmingly i think most private traders are looking at charts when they start out and my original thing was all right i'm going to provide this technical research to institutional private traders which is what i'm still doing but i got basically i got swamped when i first sort of started putting stuff out there people said can you teach me to trade you know and brokers saying can you teach me to trade and i said well Right, I didn't realize it was quite such. I knew this was going to be a part of my business going forward. But oh yeah, you went, you worked at Goldman Sachs, you worked at BNP, you worked at Macquarie. We want you to teach us how to trade. So effectively, what I'm doing now is, as I said, I'm writing these technical reports, I'm writing market analysis, and most Wednesday nights when you guys are doing your wicks and whiskey, um, I'm running trader education webinars. It's just that this this wasn't one of the nights which coincided with that. Hence the reason I'm on the show tonight. Do you, do you normally do drink whiskey whilst doing the trading education? Do I what? <laughs> whiskey whilst educating people? What I can tell you is I've got the, um, the, the webinar apparatus a little bit more sorted than I had tonight. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. I mean, okay, as, I mean, you mentioned you had a stint where you even left and started trading for yourself. So effectively, you went from the bank to being, from the institution to being a retail trader, and now you're dealing with a few retail traders. What? What do you feel the most common things that retail traders do that ends yeah, them messing well, up, that leads to them failing? What? Yeah, and that's one of the things we teach. We know, what's the difference between retail traders and institutional traders? And um, I really enjoyed the hedge fund space. Not to say, um, you know, I didn't learn things from the other people that I was speaking to and working with, but I really was interested in how hedge fund traders, how they manage their risk and the first point about private traders is they trade too big and they trade too often. And if I said to you, look, Omar, the average account size that people open is $10,000 and they put on a trade for 
whatever they might go along the Aussie or the S and P, and they're going to risk a thousand dollars. So they're going to risk ten percent of their account on the very first trade. And you look at the maths behind that, and you think, well, how many losing trades can I have in a row? And for me, I know it's six, right? So that's the most losing trades I'll have in a row. So I can effectively lose six grand of that ten thousand dollars, or I'm down over fifty percent. But for me to get my account back to square, I've got to make a hundred percent back. Now that's a different story because in this day and age where interest rates are zero and that's your risk-free rate of return, trying to make a hundred percent consistently um, or, or as a one-off is very, very difficult. So the biggest thing is they trade too big. So I try to keep my risk, and this is something which I've learned from the hedge fund guys. Basically, I'm risking a fixed percentage of my account and it's nowhere near 10%. It's closer to 1% because if I lose 1% six times in a row, I'm down 6%. That's okay. I stay in the game. If I lose six losing trade, if I have six losing trades in a row and I've dusted 60% of my account, I'm about to be carted out, right? So because I've got to make a shitload of money to get back just to square. So the first thing is the, the private traders or the retail traders just trade too big. Um, the second thing is something we touched on already that they trade too often. Um, you know, I think many ways people see trading as like a casino um, and, and, you know, they attracted to the lights, they're attracted to the numbers. You know, I want to turn a small account into a large account and they don't put any more thought into it than that. The problem with that is if they're just doing it for a buzz or a kick, they're better off going to the casino. They've probably got better odds. And not only that, they can buy a drink and have a feed as well. So, you know, it's for me, trading isn't about having fun. Yes, I enjoy trading. But if these guys are just doing it for a thrill, um, which I think quite a few do undertake trading for, then they're in the wrong area. So too big, too often, um, they're not disciplined as well. And you hear the old trading adages. I mean, I could wheel them out all night for you. You've heard most of them, and I'm sure Grant's spoken about them. But, you know, let your profitable trades run. You know, cut your losing trades. You know, I was speaking about Bitcoin before. I had a stop loss. You know, I was long around 9,200. My stop loss was at 8,000. It ended up getting filled closer to 6,000. That's okay. Um, I risk a very small, as I said, you know, closer to 1% than 10%. Yeah. So, you know, even though Bitcoin, I was pretty annoyed by that Bitcoin move and it cost me some money, um, it, it, I'm, you know, I'm still in the game. My account's still going well and, and we live to fight another day. So that's the one thing I'd say, you know, if I could sum up those three points, it's just, you know, try and exercise a little bit of risk management or some money management. Don't trade too big for your accounts and, and, and just keep that focus. It's not a casino. You don't need to be trading all the time. Stay patient. There is going to be other trades coming along if you miss this one. Yeah. I mean, you're hundred percent right that Grant said this every, I mean, I make a habit of making sure that any traders that come on this show are all profitable traders and literally every single one of them repeats the exact same three things. And the reason I keep asking it is just so listeners understand this most important thing to learn. It's not rocket science, right? It's, yeah. but it's hard. It's against the, the very elements of human nature. They're, they're doing it because you know, the reasons that attract traders to trading is I want to be my own boss. I want flexibility. I want lifestyle. I want to turn a small account into a large account. And all of those other reasons that you see on Instagram, guys with flash cars and boats and beautiful women. And you sort of think, well, this is just absolute, you know, for every trader that I know, we work hard. We're not out there flashing it around and doing all that type of stuff. So there's a real, I think, I'm not sure what the right word is, Grant. Is there these, you know, the, some of the stuff which you see? I think is just a little bit out of line of the reality. Most traders I know no, work I look, very, very hard. Yeah, no, I looked at that. I mean, it's from my the way I saw. It, to be honest, why I keep telling the guys in the show is just that the more I look into it, the more I realize is there's a group of people in trading, as in any industry, that are incentivized to tell you trading is easy because to them they will give you false information, sign you up, do false things, get you trading because they want you to lose your money. And there's a lot of that. And there's a lot, I mean, especially the Instagram ads. Those, I mean, I remember what they said last time. It's like, I never, I haven't been there where I sat on a yacht trading. Nobody does that. It's, it's just, look, I, I, look, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's some long-term traders who can fly into their boat from their helicopter from, <laughs> you know, the, somewhere on the med. I don't know. But you know, most of the guys I know are very diligent. They work hard. They read a lot. And they do the things which goes against the grain, which is that 
geez, I don't want to take a loss. You know, that, that two grand loss, I'm just going to see if it comes back to square. And then it becomes a four grand loss. And the four grand loss suddenly becomes an eight grand loss and they're out of the game. And they've worked hard to make that 10 grand. To make that 10 grand, they probably had to earn 20 grand. And, and that's the thing which they're good at going against the grain and they do it every time. The other thing, of course, professional traders, like I mentioned to you, my, I knew where my Bitcoin stop was, but it wasn't able to be executed at that point of time. So your professional traders always know where they're getting out of a trade if they're wrong. And, and that means that they're going to lose money. Now, losing money, unfortunately, is part of the game. If you come up to an Instagram ad and this guy says, listen, every trade we've put on for the last six weeks has made money. Look, maybe it's possible to do over a six-week period. Over a six-month period, it's impossible. So you have to walk away from them. Losing trades is part of money. The key is how you manage those losing trades and that you ensure that you're making more money when you are having winning trades and when you're losing. And again, this goes against the very nature of, 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 I think, private traders. Private traders go, oh, look, I'll let that two grand. I'll just watch that. You know, it's gone against me a little bit. Oh, God, it's four grand. Now it's 10 grand. I'm going to put some more money in. I, mean, yeah. I had a, remember talking, you know, I was on the private client desk at JB Weir, as I mentioned in the futures, and I had a lovely, lovely client, and he was – Long the Aussie, this is going back to 2000, around the time of the Olympics. And the Aussie dollar started falling. It went from sort of 68 to 62s, then into the low 50s. And he kept buying, he kept topping more money up. For anyone that remembers the 2000 Olympics, um, the Aussie dollar was actually below 50 cents or, or right on 50 cents when it occurred. The Americans loved it. They came over and said, geez, you've got a wonderful country and everything's half price over here. So, you know, the, the natural instinct for this chap was, I'm just going to keep buying more Aussie dollars and he ended up getting stopped out near 48 cents or something before the rebound up to 110 uh, which occurred 11 years later but that's my point it's just the fact that people don't want to take a loss they're not thinking about right I'm putting this trade on and I'm going to get out if it makes me a thousand dollars but what if that trade doesn't work out what if that trade's wrong then well, all of a sudden it becomes a long-term position doesn't it and long-term positions have a very very uncomfortable habit of becoming final positions. Yeah, <laughs> final positions. Yeah. What, what do you feel, Tony, on like a, something I was, we, we spoke about actually on Sunday, I was also this, I guess, like what would you say, like, like almost like proclivity of people to get into trading, but they actually don't really care about the activity as such. Like, like as you said, like you, you look at a chart, and you like looking at the chart. You actually get there. You're doing it from an interest point of view. You're doing it from a professional point of view, and you're doing it as a point of view to make money. But you know, what about? I think there's a lot of retail traders who just go, "I want to make money," and they might even work at it to a degree. But I, I, I think if you're a person who can't turn up and say that you're actually interested in learning about markets and charts and price action and that, I think you. Like, I think you're in a world of hurt from the start. I agree. And, and you and I come from a similar background. I mean, we've chewed the fat over a number of steaks and a couple of beers and yeah. a couple of glasses of red. And, you know, I know on your spill, you're a pure student of the game. But I think for anyone that wants to be in this game, they've got to study, they've got to learn, they've got to understand what drives markets. And I think it comes back to what I was saying. I think a lot of and, it, and it, I guess maybe what's happening now in the Robin Hood world of private traders in the US, it's probably setting a bad example. You've got this guy who sells his business for $600 million and he doesn't care if he's making three or four, you know, if he makes $300,000 in a day or loses $300,000 in a day, he doesn't give a rat's ass. But, you know, he's made $660 million selling his business. And I think that probably, you know, that's giving trading a little bit of a misnomer that it's easy. Um, you know, if, if Dave Portney, who sold his business off, can then go and out trade Warren Buffett, then it, geez, it must be an easy game. And look, the guy's done very well. Don't get me wrong, and he's getting a lot of eyeballs on his websites and on on his YouTube channels and all that type of thing. But it's not an easy game, and you do have to learn about it. And yes, he is having a good run. But what I would be also saying is, if if that guy lost five million dollars, he wouldn't care. It doesn't matter. Mm. He's had some fun. And if you lose $5 million and you have fun and you can afford to lose $5 million, good on you. you know, for $5 million, it's a lot of people. For, it's a yeah. lot of money for most people. For him, it's nothing. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. 
No, yeah, that's that's completely fair. Uh, we have a question from someone, Jake. Uh, the Robin Hood Traders, new era. <laughs> there we go. I'm muted. Hey, Jake. How are you? Hey, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, really, really fascinating stuff. And, uh, and Tony, I think it's pretty incredible how succinct you've really got the points across in terms of those positions and just some of the fundamentals. I think that's um, definitely one of the clearest communicators of, of some of those I've heard um, through this and lots of other um, webinars and, and online ramblings. Um, so, you know, props to you and thank you for sharing. Our pleasure. You mentioned earlier that you have been training Bitcoin and uh, I know it was dismissed, you know, not worry about the rest of them, but you did indicate I've been training Bitcoin and a few others. What are the few others that you referred to in cryptocurrencies? <laughs> yeah, the, the broker, which I, I've got two accounts. One broker doesn't let me hold positions over the weekend in crypto um, and the other one only offers it basically on, I think there's three or four um, and the, the, what, the other one I've been looking at is Ethereum. And, you know, that's purely because yeah. the bro it's one of the ones that the brokers offers. But it's also, you know, I, I, I've, I've looked at a little bit about what it does. You know, it's the, the, some of the, you know, what it's supposed to do. And, and I guess I, by trading Bitcoin and Ethereum, you're probably covering both bases in some respects, you know. Bitcoin is a currency, it is something you invest in, whereas Ethereum, according to my research, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to go too deeply into the, 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 you guys can probably correct me on this, but Ethereum seems to be more like a platform which other cryptocurrencies can be, um, you know, more of a platform. So I like the fact that, yeah, and it, it, it does have that going for it, but it's also purely just because I, I don't have a wide option. These ETFs, they trade on a Swedish exchange, and, and there's not that many of them. So that's the ones that I'm looking at. And, and just out of curiosity, why is it that they don't um, support trading on the weekends? Is that, is, that, is that they won't allow you to hold through a weekend? No, no, they will. Weekend? They let they let me hold it through the weekend, but the, it's actually on the Swedish Stock Exchange. So the Swedish Stock Exchange oh. is open from about 6 p.m. our time. I'm in Sydney, and it closes at around midnight our time, I think, or 1 a.m. So it's purely a fact that when that Stock Exchange closes – that ETF closes and it's, it's not a leverage product either. It's basically just a, you know, it's like buying BHP uh, here in Australia. It's not a leverage product. Fantastic. Thank you. A pleasure. Thanks, Jake. Mm. Now that is something that's interesting about the Ethereum, uh, just for your knowledge, you might learn from this is that, the way we look at it is Ethereum is actually the safe way to bet on all other cryptocurrencies because you were 100% right. It is a platform. And the safe way to actually, if you wanted to say that all the altcoins are going to do something very interesting, the safe way to get an index of all those other coins is to just place a bet on Ethereum. Because right. they go up, Ethereum will go up. Okay. Well, that's good to know because I actually didn't know that. I mean, I, first heard, I was working in CBA when I first heard about cryptocurrencies and I don't think it was specifically relating to Bitcoin, but the, the bankers at the time at CBA were talking about the threat that it posed to the banking business model and they, they didn't really, you know, I think probably one or two of the, the, the younger chaps saw the, the benefits that it offered, but for the establishment, if you like, they were looking at it as a threat. And now, you know, we're five, six years down the track and it's, well, you know, how can we make our processing costs cheaper? How can we make this quicker? And, and that's where I think people have come 100, you know, 180 degrees in some respects. But at that time, oh, geez, this cryptocurrency, this is going to, it's going to undermine, you know, eat into our profitability and do all this and that type of thing. And, um, and that's where I first heard about it. I, I, you know, guys were trading it long before I'd heard of it. Um, so it was, I was probably, you know, 2016, whereas you guys have probably been in that space for a lot longer. It warms my heart to hear that we were actually a threat at some point to the bank. I wasn't aware, <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, yeah no, that uh, was, look, I'm not good. speaking at least, on at least all banks' something. behalf. And I know even Jamie Dimon's <laughs> launched a couple of cryptocurrencies now, hasn't he, Grant? So maybe the banks, maybe the whole... support now. But he's also banked two crypto exchanges as well, so yeah, he's, they're fully on board. Yeah. Okay. Just those Luddites and Goldmans who still haven't figured out that it's going to win. 
<laughs> well, they've, they're, they're setting up a Goldman's prop trading desk, apparently, aren't they? Even though prop trading is not allowed and they don't trade crypto. So we'll see what happens there. Okay. Uh... <laughs> What what are you looking at now in the in the sort of the for the Bitcoin move, Grant? I mean, I know you trade off charts a little bit, but you're more yeah. macro. Mate, oh, well, uh, I, I, the way I'm looking at it is it's it's obviously we it did a, it had the, the there was a near term downtrend in place, and then we had that PayPal news, and Bitcoin popped through it, and then sort of you know got everyone out got everyone weekends long and then did a nice flush out move there. What it all it said got down to like 8,900 almost. And then, you know, rebounded itself now into that basically a 9,000 to 9,300 type range. Um, it's on decreasing volume, decreasing volatility. To me, it feels like it, it's going to go lower, but it doesn't seem to have every time it hits 9,000 in the last you know, what, two, two, three, four, five days. doesn't seem to have much interest to want to go lower. Yeah. Um, but my, my concern would be more if we had, you know, would be now is, you know, we get a, a bad night in the US where, you know, I don't know, we get something like, you know, 100,000 new COVID cases or something like that and the S&P does slice off 3%. Bitcoin's going to go through, of course, it's sitting on some big levels. It's going to go through those levels and potentially, you know, in a thin market, it's, it could get some real, it could really get some momentum, I think, to the downside, which really, as we said, is is, is as low as 7,600. So it's not, it's, it's, it's as you, you know, rightly point out, it's in the middle. If you think, if you call 9,100 as, as the rate, as the mean at the moment, <clears throat> it's literally in the middle. It's, yeah. it's, it's equally distant from 10,500 as it yes. is to 7,600. So yeah. it you is. You can't buy it, you can't sell it right here, can you? It's not cheap enough to buy and it's not expensive enough to sell. I think you want to be, I think you want to be long volatility somehow in it. Uh, yeah. would, be, would be the play. It, it seems to be very cheap at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think otherwise it's hard. I mean, you know, as you, you know, coming back to think something you, you have some insights on, like, you know, the dollar index obviously is now giving no clear signs either after, you know, having a lot, a lot of movement. It also, it's retracted into a very tight um, range, like uh, on DXY. Is there anything you're looking at there? Yeah, there is. I, I, I think it comes back to this non, you know, we've got this long weekend coming up in the US. We've got Non-farm, non-farm payrolls, which is released on Thursday, early on Thursday. So effectively, it becomes a three-and-a-half-day holiday in the US. Yeah. I think they're going to get that number out of the way. It could be a big positive. It could be a big negative. We don't know. But I think one way or the other, people are going to look at the long weekend and say, holy shit, we could get that. You know, we could be close to, whatever, 50,000, 60,000 new cases. Um, the week after next, we're not going to go home long. So I think you get a bit of risk reduction into the long weekend, which potentially we know when the market hits that risk aversion or that risk aversion mode that the US dollar generally finds a bid. And I think what that can do is see the US dollar rally a touch higher than where it is currently, maybe up towards 98.40. Uh, 98.20 is a wave of quality target. 98.40 is a 200-day moving average. So I'd be looking to fade that dollar rally into Friday, Saturday morning type thing because like I said on Monday morning, I, I, even if the market does gap lower, I've seen it time and time again over long weekends are seasonally bullish. But mm. right now, if there's ever a time when patriotic Americans, particularly in the markets, need to wave the flag, i.e. the Fed, um, you know, just to be a little bit of jawboning, you know, a bit of support, whatever the reason is you, you, you might like to think about I think that the market rallies next week. So, and if the market's rallying, we're back in some risk seeking. That would mean that the DXY, which we're thinking pops up into the end of the weekend, into the weekend, potentially starts to trade lower again and retest that 95.72 low. So, yeah, I, I've got, I'm, I'm currently, like I mentioned, I'm square, I'm waiting, I'm being patient. I'm hoping that this scenario plays out. Maybe it's too obvious. Maybe it doesn't happen. I don't know. But that's my preferred scenario at the moment, that we see the US dollar pop into the weekend and then 
following the long weekend, uh, the end of the long weekend, I think it starts to trade lower. And what's the what's the your then longer term outlook on the dollar on the charts? What's the looking? Yeah, like? I think it's broken lower. Uh, you know, and and I don't. You know, there's some intriguing and very opposing views out there. You've got your 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 Brett Johnson from San Diego and the Dollar Bulls led by Raul and. Um, and then you've got Lynn Alden, who I think speaks you know, very well, and she talks about why there's not a dollar deficit and blah, 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 blah. So there's some very, I mean, that's what makes a market. But just looking at the technicals, um, you know, while it's below that, and I don't want to sort of make too big a calls here. I'm not calling the dollar down 10% or up 10%. I'm just looking at now in the terms that if the, Oz, if the, the DXY index, which is the US dollar index, st- Stays below 98.40 and the euro stays above, let's say, 111-ish. Um, I think the US dollar will remain under pressure. I think this is a correction. We've seen quite a few markets go into that consolidation stage. Bitcoin's one of them. The DXY, you know, the DXY was selling off quite sharply a few weeks ago. It's now consolidating as well. So my view is that we see another few days of consolidation to upwards price action in the US dollar and then it starts to fall away. And where the DXY could fall to is maybe I think ninety three fifty would be the you know we've got ninety five seventy two which was a low we saw a couple of weeks ago and then potentially down to ninety three fifty which probably puts a euro at one fifteen one sixteen ish. Yeah, I'm just I'm actually looking at the, at the chart right now. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite interesting. Don't front my don't front my trade, Omar. Don't front you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jake, you had your hand up. I put you on. Do you have a question? What did you do that yeah. by mistake? Yeah. Go. Yeah. So, um, just my background was in trading media. Um, so building futures platforms, spot trading markets for digital media. And just a, a curious sort of unrelated to trading. I'm just sort of mentioning it is we, we saw a lot of really interesting things and I've been doing that over in the U S for about the last decade and just really recently back to Australia. And uh, we saw some really interesting things when people were early switching their budget towards the Facebooks and Googles and everything like that. Really big effort on their behalf to get big brand advertising, Fortune 100 companies, mm. and put budgets towards those platforms and move them away from traditional media, TV, print, all of those things. Well, that happened in droves. Now, we're seeing a little bit of a swing backwards there, um, whether it's re- related to um, Black Lives Matter with Facebook or just their position generally about conversation and how they, whether they are moderating or not moderating, so many major brands pulling their money out of these platforms creates a huge revenue gap for these companies. So I think Facebook's expecting 30% down on revenue, yet they're up to 2.6% on their stock. But the interesting thing about that is it creates an opportunity. They're going to have to do something for their shareholders to fill the gap. And one of the biggest ways to fill your gap is the history of automated trading in media has been affiliate revenue, has been direct response campaigns and things like that. And what has just been dominating that space really since probably the end of 2017 with crypto has been these learn how to be rich. And you guys talked about this earlier, you know, I trade on my yacht and all of that sort of thing. If we do see that continue where brands sort of pull back a little bit, whether it's, you know, for economic reasons, financial, political, whatever, and we see these huge platforms that dominate time spent by most Australian consumers and we start to see more of these ads in your recommendation Tony with your business and how you position things what would you suggest is a good way to combat that from a conversation to elevate it even just from a pure awareness not necessarily to get people to sign up for you to listen to you over others but just purely as like a uh, you know public service announcement of hey if it sounds too good to be true it probably is but from the expert opinion of somebody like yourself, what, what would you recommend we could do there? Yeah. Well, we were speaking at lunch today, Jack. And um, sorry, Jake. And, and, and one of the things, you know, I don't go out there and say I'm going to make a hundred percent a year. I mean, my account, I'm happy with the way it's gone. Um, you know, we've outperformed stocks. We, we, we've done well this year, but in terms of making noise, you've got, like you said, this, these influences and, um, it, it's hard, right? It's hard for people, you know, unless you, I mean, even I think Raul and some of these guys probably sell a lot of subscriptions by making big calls, whether it be about the US dollar or the stock market or about their returns. And I look at the what's taking place, Jake, and I think people are very easily 
sucked in. Um, and that's a sad thing because they're not doing their research. They're not doing, you know, I saw some guy who's just restarted up his business and he's talking about his stock portfolio since April. Now, you or I could just throw darts at a board and our stock portfolio would be up from April, but he's sucking people going, my stock portfolio is up this from April. And you sort of think, geez, what the fuck happened to your stock portfolio in March then? You know, for what, you know, what's, you know, April was easy. April has just gone up. Effectively, it's gone up. And it's, if people can't look through that sort of stuff and potentially do a little bit of their own research, I think that's a problem. Um, in terms of actually flagging it to the masses, well, I don't know how you get that message out there, Jake. It's a tough message, and you know I'm, I'm I've been watching what's happening with Facebook and the, the the advertisers pulling money away from those platforms. Potentially, it leaves you know these guys. I mean, they're not going to say no to these guys' money. Is I think one of the things about you know these guys they they are very you would know better than I, but you know, Facebook, you can target an audience, you can reach the people you want to reach, and they're very, very effective in that respect. Um, and I don't think Facebook are going to want to turn away that money. And if they ran a sort of a broad-based campaign saying, hey, listen, you need to take, you know, I think the disclaimers are on there in most instances anyway, but you've got to be very, very careful. And and if, if there was one message that I could get out there is you've got to do your due diligence. And for me, I look at the guys on things like Twitter and Instagram and I think, well, and, and we, you know, Grant and I come from very similar background. The easy way to know if someone's talking, um, you know, nonsense or not is to just ask them to produce some trading records. Now, if anyone asks me to produce my trading records, I'm happy to do that. And it'll show you that we've made money. But I look at some of these people out there and they're, they're making claims. And I sort of think, all you got to do if, if you, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. That's the first thing. And if you're still interested, ask them to see us to see their track record. And if they're not willing to produce a track record, then that probably means they're phonies. That's the only thing I can say, right? Just if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And if you're still interested, go and ask, you know, people are making hundreds of thousands of dollars selling trading courses. Go and ask them to see how that trading course has translated into P&L in their trading account. Now, I effectively am educating people. So I'm in some respects selling a trading course, but I'd make it very clear what, you know, I'm a discretionary trader. So that means that yes, I use Elliott wave. Yes. I use candlesticks. Yes. I use trend lines. Yes. I use Fibonacci retracements, but I also deal that with things like seasonals, inner market analysis, what interest rates are doing, what credit spreads are doing. So I've got many, many different inputs coming into my process. So for me to tell you that I'm looking at one or two things isn't completely accurate. And I make that up front. So that's why we run, you know, 14, 15 webinars, because there's a lot to cover. And what I'm doing is trying to give you the ingredients or, or the tools, which I use in my trading process. But you know, if you're systematic guys that are selling black boxes, you know, why are they selling a black box system? If the black box system is so good, why aren't they trading it? I mean, Jim Simons from Renaissance isn't selling his artificial intelligence, is he? He's not selling his trading system. That's because that trading system makes a shitload of money for Jim and his, and his shareholders. He's not selling that to anyone for $10,000. So to me, you've got to come back to that. Why are they doing this? Is it too good to be true? And if I'm still interested, can I see your credentials? Can you show me your track record? Can you show me that you consistently make money? And that's the key. I love it. And I just in, 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 in marketing talk, I think the, the succinctness and the, and the Brits did this first with the whole COVID thing, which was, you know, promoting those three separate things related to how you need to manage things. And we do it here in Australia, you know, wash your hands, download the app, social distance. I feel like there could be something as simple as exactly what you just said, you know. Look, um, if you come up with a good reason. message for me, Jake, please <laughs> let me know because, I mean, that's a battle that I have. And, and yeah. you know, on Facebook, you obviously know a lot about media and advertising. Um, you know, there's guys out there spending eighty, a $100,000 on advertising a month. And I sort of sit there and think, geez, what I spend isn't even a drop in the ocean. You know, do I even bother? Um, and do I even bother saying, listen, my trading account will make you this when there's guys out there saying, I'm going to make you 200% every day for the rest of your life. And you sort of think, how do I cut through that noise? I mean, you guys might have a better idea or a better take on it than I do, but there's got to be a degree of if it's too good to be true, it is. But 
I think there's still a lot of gullible people out there. I think the other thing, Jake, for a lot of people as well is you, you know, personally, I really wouldn't recommend you doing a trading course unless you've actually at least even attempted a little bit of trading, you know, so you can go to Tony's point, so you can even begin to, you know, sort sort it out, you know, and actually understand what the reference and the terms are. It's very, very difficult to turn up and then just sort of go, well, you know, I'm going to pick this guy in his course because of this, this and this. But if you don't understand any of the things that are going on, you know, you're almost got no chance from the outset. So you're going to buy a course and you're going to, you're going to think, well, it might be good, it might be bad, but how would you even be in a position to assess if it was good or bad if you don't even have, you know, some relevant knowledge to even begin to understand what was covered in it? Yeah, no, that's a... I'm oh, sorry, I was just going to say, Grant, that's a good, great point. The, the the thing that you guys were talking about earlier with the gambling, there seems to be some really interesting data correlating to that. Even ComSec said it. They had more people sign up in the month of March for ComSec trading accounts than they'd had for, like, the 12 months prior to that. And there seems to be, I mean, you see it with Robin Hood, you see it with Macquarie Bank. There seems to be an appetite, whether that's because people can't go out or they can't put money in the slot machines or whatever mm-hmm. it happens to be, there seems to be this appetite for the general public for more risk when it comes to these markets. And so I just, I'm just curious about, I agree with all the fundamentals of what you're talking about in terms of people who might actively trade it and seek to be good at it. But I think that there could be a lot of other people who are sucked down the drain of it through these influences there where people who have a reputation and can back it up with their records and their trading history um, and their trading records, those voices should find a way to be bubbled to the surface just from an, an awareness perspective. I think that, that some there needs to be some general awareness about what the rules are before those people click to the next video on YouTube to find out how they're going to make a million dollars in seven days. Yeah. That just is a big gap. And it's hard, Jake. I mean, you talk about, you know, I talk about a track record or a trading record and, this is something Grant and I have spoken about before. Um, you know, Bernie Madoff, his p l curve was basically from the bottom left-hand side of your screen to the top right-hand side of your screen in a perfect line. Like you couldn't have drawn a straighter line. Now, a real p l curve doesn't look like that. It goes up, it consolidates, sometimes it goes down and then it goes up again. But Bernie's p l curve was basically drawn by a ruler. and it took a long time for people on Wall Street, and these are financially literate, educated people, to catch on what he was doing. I mean, he was putting it out there saying, I'm making a shitload of money, but it was just, I mean, Grant, I think we've spoken about, it was just a giant Ponzi scheme, right? And his yeah. track record, and it makes it hard. So it's, you're right, there should be some warnings there. Yep, okay, you understand uh, the beginner's course. Let's go into the intermediate course. Um, but even the very sophisticated investors which are on Wall Street were fooled by this guy. And it's, it's difficult. It is difficult. And I, I get that it's a struggle and a challenge. But I don't know, I don't know if there's a, 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 full, a foolproof way of weeding these guys out. I think if there was, they'd probably be gone by now. There, there really isn't. You can't. I mean, nothing, technically, nothing they're really doing is illegal in any way. And nothing there. It's just... Again, it's, it's, it's an issue of people oversimplifying something. The idea of becoming, becoming rich isn't easy. If it was, everybody would be rich. Anybody telling you getting rich is easy, is, being rich is a reward for hard work. If you're not willing to put in the hard work, I mean, that's, that's how it is. Uh, so, yeah, I know Tony needs to leave soon, so just... Th- thanks a lot, Tony. We really, really enjoyed having you on. Uh, that was very, very informative. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the questions as well. If there's <laughs> no. one more question, I've got time for one more question. I've, uh, if, if, if there's one Anyone? more question, otherwise I'll dingle off and wish you guys well. No. Righto. Done. I'll post this after and I'll tag you in it. But no, thanks a lot for coming on. Really learned a lot from you, man. My pleasure. Great. Thank you for having me. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Take care, Tom. But yeah, continue to talk about that. I mean, guys, just I mean, just simple logic. I mean, it's, yeah. So anyone telling you something? I mean, we had a bunch of good traders on here from CT. I mean, last Sunday we had Trader Man, and that guy's he has a you can see he's a good trader, and he told you anybody blindly listening to me, a chicken, a robot chicken with a gun for an arm, <laughs> on Twitter, 
how do you expect to make money? And that's a good trader telling you that. We had Big, Big Man on the other day, and he told you, he's like, guys, I lose, I lose, how about, I win six trades and lose four out of 10, 60%. That's my rough hit rate. But that's what happens. You do lose. And when you lose, you need to control that loss. Anybody constantly telling you I'm always winning, anybody uh, promising you riches beyond your dreams, anyone, it's trading is a profession, very, very, pro it can be very profitable if you're good at it, but you need to respect the craft, give it its time. It's more about consistency. It's not the one big time win that makes you rich. Yes, you will, you will at some point find that one trade you want to go all in on and that's it. It makes you a shit ton of money. But generally, it's just about consistently making small returns on the overall sum. And those consistent returns will compound. And eventually, you'll grow your account in something significant. I mean, am I, am I on point there, Grant? I mean, <laughs> yeah, mate, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, and the reason why I bring up the thing about do you actually, are you interested in it, is, is a thing that I, I never really thought about it until, you know, I think it was really with Bitman. Was, was it, it, really was, it was really obvious there that he is getting probably more than 50% of the people who interact with him, who hit him up, who do his trading courses, who are following him on crypto Twitter, have actually zero interest in trading as a thing, like as a concept or, or understanding markets or understanding underlying tokens or coins or, or psychology or any of that. It is literally that they want money. And then, and that's and that's it. And it's like, well, if you want money, well, you should work more hours in your job rather than than coming to do trading just for money. You have to have a, a, some underlying interest in it. And that's the part that I found really interesting is, is that. And if you are a person, if you walk away and you've been in, you've been trading for a while, and you walk away and you go, well, I've got no, I don't really care what's going on. Like you probably should just could quit there and then. And that's the other thing. I think the other thing which I think a lot of people do is is then they don't want to quit. Like they want to, they, they decide then they're going to keep with it or, or if they do it for another week, they'll get there or a week more, they'll get there or a week more, they'll get there. Like at some point, if you've given it some time and you've dedicated yourself and you've worked at it, also, it's, you know, it's probably telling you something and that's telling you it's probably, you know, not for you. And that's the other thing. Like this is, a, uh, this is a point we were talking about the other day. You name other hobbies or professions where if you failed at it 20 times in a three-year period, what other hobbies or professions would you stay doing? If you're, if you're into golf and you go, you go to golf and you hit every ball in the water for, for six months in a row, you ain't, you ain't going to stick with it. You quit. And you throw your golf clubs in the, in the water and you feel better and you go home. Like, it's it's to me. I find it really really interesting that people think somehow trading is is a is a different beast. It's like, well, no, no, no. Like I don't have to, you know, do that. I can just keep going. Like, it's I, I think it's really even back like even back in my early days of trading. I mean, it's I think some massive massive misconceptions. It's easy to say, and we keep saying over and over again that it's not really a game of chance. That's not what's happening here. That's <laughs> it's. It has a weird way of drawing you into it. And then you're looking at the chart and you're like, no, no, but this one will save me from all the other ones. But yeah, it, it really isn't like that. As you said, you need to, you can't, as, the end result of trading is to make money. That's, that's what you're doing effectively by trading. You're buying something, selling it, making a profit. But as cliche as it is, and we said it last week, you can't, you can't make money doing something if you're strictly doing it for the money. Yeah. You need to trade because you enjoy trading. You like trading. You, that's what you like doing. Yes, the byproduct of it is money, but that's what it has to be. It has to be the byproduct. I was talking about personal example on me. I've been doing very well in my trading, except last month when I decided that I'm going to flip an amount to turn it to a certain amount of cash. The focus became on that result, on the money. And I just mm -hmm. lost all that month. I just kept losing the whole month. And as soon as that issue got solved, I was back to winning my trades again. Yeah. I was like, what? It just changes your whole perspective of how you look at the trade, how you're charting, how you're... And again, it's a, not everybody has to be a trader. I mean, some people, yeah, you like this space, you can be an investor. You can, some, most people are actually better off just buying and holding their coins. That's... Oh, especially, I mean, and especially if it is something, as you said, if, it's a, if you're actually then interested, like in, say, the technological side of it, sure, that's actually by far the best thing to do. You know, if you're, if you're a person who's come into this from you know, a technology background or, you know, computer science background or, 
whatever it may be, but you, you know, it's it's the protocol and the chain and the and the you know all the other stuff that's going into it's your your jam. Yeah, you're way better off just buying the tokens you think are cool or, or that's got interesting tech or might work. You know, yeah. rather than trying to trade it. And if you, I mean, you don't want to stay flat. That's that's understandable. I mean, you can make a lot more money doing your job, focusing on your job, getting paid more. Keep stacking sats. You can put them with us of mine. You can get paid interest or any other interest provider, and you're actually increasing your stack as well. And that's, but because most people, will, it's not, it's not something you can just, you know, I'm just gonna open the chart and just do it, and I'm gonna make money. No, you're gonna lose yeah. if you just. I mean, a that, great example is if you literally look at the chart tonight on a short term basis, right? It is just terrible looking. We 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 look like we're gonna go live for all money. Went through nine thousand one hundred. And then it started rallying. It looks like it's going to go through 9,200. It stops literally $4 short or $2 short, 9,200. Now it's gone back right in the middle. We're literally back at 9,150. <laughs> and you, you could have potentially have had, I don't know, no, no, no joke, you easily could have had five positions on in that period of time thinking it might have been going to go lower. Oh, now it's going to go higher. Oh, now, no, no, it's going to go higher. So, no, no, now it's going to go lower. Again, like if you are if you're a person who, who if you are just doing this to to chase money, you will have all those five positions on. You would have had five losers, and you're now in a real problem because you the market is still doing nothing. So there's going to, not going to be an ability to make that money back, um, and you're just caught in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, versus if you just had sat on your hands and just watched it go up, down, up, down, up, down, you, the market's going nowhere, and you're no worse off. Um, yeah, I, I find it interesting. Like I just said, like personally, I I never got into trading because anyone told me about it. I found it for myself. I didn't ever get into it to make money either. I got into it was because of, I thought it was important. You know, being being a university it would be something that would come up in job interviews and things like that. But it was you know it wasn't that wasn't what kept me in it either. It was by that stage of by. The time I'd actually needed for university, I was more convinced about doing it from a personal point of view and interest than it was anything to do with my career. Um, and and yeah, that, that's the part I think for most people. If you can't, if you can't, if you can't say how that you got yourself into it or that you found some self interest in it, yeah, I would you know very quickly recommend for most people to sort of step away from it and and you know. Or, or, or take some time off and revisit it. And the other, the other one I think is important for people, which has now come up, you know, basically two, two, two in a row, you know, with Bitman and Trader Main, is also those guys go and look at other markets. You know, it's not saying that Bitcoin has to be the only market you're trading. You know, those, those guys are looking at equity indices, they're looking at FX marks, they're looking at gold, um, and they may be looking at individual stocks, but... You know, again, it's one of these things. If you come into this space, you 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 got to you know you got to find sort of the, the rhythm for you, and that could be a different market. It doesn't necessarily have to be crypto or Bitcoin. It could be Aussie dollar. It could be milk. It could be S and P five hundred. You know, but you got to again, you got to keep trying and 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 experimenting. And that's the one thing I'd say. Like, like personally, <clears throat> for me, the biggest advice I give to anyone who is in this space is put aside a an amount of money and just trade it, you know, learn some basic rules, but then just trade it how you want to try to trade it and see where you get to. Because ultimately, you're going to learn and teach yourself a lot more by doing that than trying to prescriptively read 100 books. Trust me, I read, I've read i read probably more than 100 books on trading, but I read them whilst I'm experimenting. And, and, the, and that's a, you know, you're going to take more in on, on that regard rather than just, but, you know, just either just trading or just reading the books is, is in my eyes, the worst thing you do. You've got to, you've got to put your balls on line at some point. Blowing accounts is at a passage. It yeah. Just as you need to do it. Plus, everyone has a, I, trust me, there's not, there, there would be, there is not a trader out there, whether they're the lowliest guys who have got 10 bucks to their name to the biggest traders in the world. There is not one of them that's not blown up an account. I literally, <laughs> not one. It's and, the and most they, valuable lesson yeah. you ever learned. Yeah, so I remember like a good example of me was 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 when I I I went back from um, you know later in life went back from university and went back into 
into financial markets and I also kept my personal account at that time. Now, when I was at university studying, I was able to trade a lot and I put in the appropriate amount of time. Then when I started back into financial markets, gig, well, I was doing that for 12 hours a day and then I was trying to trade this thing on the side. Um, and, you know, before I knew it, it was like six months in and, yeah, I'd lost 80% of the account and obviously in my job, I'd not, I'd not lost 80% in my job. And it's like, well, why did I do that? Well, I did that because I was not focusing on that account. That account to me was it was a smaller balance. It was like 15 grand. I put it in there and I was like, I was thinking, oh, yeah, these trades, oh, yeah, they're going to be right long term. Like exactly what Tony was saying. Like, oh, yeah, these are now long term trades or whatever. And it took me getting it down to like, I ran it down to like to about three grand. And I remember I just sitting there, it was over Christmas. And I just was sitting there and I'm like, oh, well, I've, I've just lost $12,000 for no reason. Absolutely nothing. I've not. I've not ran, I've not really had any good positions on, I've not really thought about the ones I've had on, blah, blah, blah. And then I just sat there and I was just resolved to myself and said, okay, you now get this thing back to, you got to get it back to 10 grand. And I went back to doing everything I knew that worked. You know, all the things I knew that worked, worked. And yeah, I went on a fucking, I think I went on like an eight week run. I didn't have, you know, I probably had like 90% hit rate. And I got the account back to seven and a half. And I remember at that point, I was really happy because I'm like, well, I've got it back to halfway. You know what? Even if I shut it now, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a good loss, but it's not, it's not catastrophic. I could close it. Um, anyway, long story short, it took me another 12 months to actually get it back. I ended up closing the account up five grand and, and, it, was, and it was hard graft. And, and at the time when I remember when I closed it, I'm like, I, I'm not prepared to work at that as hard as I need to when I'm working a full-time job as well. And that's the other thing as well for a lot of people you got to remember. Like, you know, I'm assuming for most, mostly everyone, you're working full-time. Like, at the end of the day, if you've then got any personal commitments you, or you like sport or other stuff, you like going out, like, you've got to then weigh it up and go, well, can I actually put in hours to this? Do I have... Do I have the ability to stay up to 3 a.m.? Do I have the ability to get up at 6 a.m.? Can I trade, you know, in the middle of the day? Like, does your boss allow you to? Can you work? Can you do it at your work? Do you work on a, you know, do you work for a build a skyscraper and you can't access the market? Like, that stuff is all important, you know. And, and for most people, again, I think it's like, well, oh, you know, those guys on the TV, as you said, or on the Instagram ads, they're on their laptop. And oh, how hard can it be? Or oh, you can just do it all on the. You can do it all. You know, put your orders in, and you're all good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that as a discipline to trade, but it's 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 going to be very very difficult for you long term to be successful if that is the entire approach you take. Is you know, you wake up, you look at a chart for ten minutes and or fifteen minutes, you put some orders in, and you hope that works. And the reason why that's not likely to work is very simple is the chart you've drawn is probably the same chart that a lot of other people are looking at. And if you then put all your orders around the obvious levels, well, you're probably going to get stopped down on them because everyone else in the market can see those same charts. Uh, so, and, and then you even ask, the top, you ask someone like Tony, right? Like there'd be so many times where, yes, he's, as he said, 60, 70, 80% driven by the charts or trade to the charts. But there's definitely times where he's adding value by, you know what, I know this is a chart pad that I should sell here, but I'm not feeling it, so I'm going to remove the order. And, and again, that's fine, not, as we've said. Like, not taking the position is, is, is an active decision, but it also means you're not going to lose. Yeah, you might not win, obviously, either, but, you know, that's, that's fine. You know, but if you're not ever in front of the screen when your orders get filled, well, you don't give yourself that ability. Um, you know, so... Yeah, and also reading the charts in real time is, I think, much more valuable than, you know, looking at them at the end of the day when all the actions happened and you look at them, you go, oh, went up, went down, oh, would have done this, would have done that. Like, you know, looking at them as they, as they, as they, you know, come to life is, I think, you know, again, you learn a lot from that. I can't underestimate, under, sorry, I shouldn't, you know, you know, encourage people to look at the charts, even if you are a 100% chart trader you know, watching them print in real time and the patterns and things like that, I think it's important. So, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, we're not, I mean, at least I'm not, I'm not trying to discourage anyone from trading. I personally think trading is a very exciting thing and it can be 
at least for me, it's been very, very profitable, but I'm just saying that yeah. you really need to give it its time and respect the craft. That's all it is. It's, it's yeah. effort. And once you put in the effort, yeah, it takes time. It took me four years until I actually knew how to trade. But once you put in that time and you learn how to do it and you start understanding what you're doing, it becomes a profitable way for you to actually make money and it becomes a lot it's more enjoyable. exciting and a lot more, yeah. Yeah, at it's, the end of the day, like no one's going to, maybe we sound like too negative. It is, it is fun. Like I, yeah. I, it's bloody fun. Like, you know. I enjoy even the losing money, even the thrill of it. It's, all, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. It, it is. It's just part of it. It is. It's just a matter of, I mean, it's just a matter of literally just taking it seriously enough, at least in the beginning, while you train yourself up, you learn what you're doing, yeah. you understand what you're doing. Again, something interesting, one of the panels said before, is you have to understand when you're trading, unlike other sports, you're not, you're not being put with beginners, with things. No, you're in the same charts trading against the biggest hedge funds. You yeah. are expected to lose. Yeah, exactly. It's normal. It's, it's nothing, nothing to be ashamed about, nothing to be... But you need, to learn, you need to learn from those mistakes, adapt, learn your own style, perfect your own craft, your own art. The way you do it, the way you trade, control your emotions, discipline. Yeah. I mean, and a great example of doing something different is tied into like something that's going on at the moment is like, you know, is, is, is the, you know, the possibilities and opportunities in DeFi and across all the different platforms, right? At yeah. some element, that's still trading because all those different platforms have different risk elements to them, whether you're, you know, minting tokens on balancer and then you're putting them into compound and then you're taking, you know, you're doing something in SNX, et cetera, et cetera. All those things still have some risk, still have risk to it. You know, for some people, that's just their natural path. They're very analytical people. They very much like things that don't move a lot, so, but they're willing to bet more and they like dissecting the trade down into its smallest, smallest little subcategory. You know, it's amazing at the moment the type of opportunities that are available there. If that's your... That's something you understand. That is some, or something that appeals to you. I'd like encourage you immensely to get you know to put in a thousand bucks and start using all these different tools and platforms out there. I mean, the, it, it, you, again, you need to understand how these things work, and the best way to do that is to actually get out there and start start doing it. But you know that it, it, you don't. It's not. I think sometimes it's one of these funny things in trading is we get gets told or gets lost, I think, to a lot of people that, well, it's picking direction. Is it going up or down? And that's it. Well, it could be that you think that Bitcoin's going up and that Ethereum will actually go up by more. So you're going to be long Ethereum Bitcoin. Or, as I said, you think that the market's not going to go anywhere, so you sell volatility. Or, you know, there's... Once you start getting into trading and you start to understand that there's there's a lot of different tools at your and options at your disposal, pardon the pun, to get into it. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily always have to be, you know, up down type thing. You know, you can you can start to think of other combinations or, or, or look at markets in very different ways. Like, you know, an interesting one, you know, we, we track in the office is like Bitcoin versus gold. Again, a lot of people in, in crypto are interested in gold. Well, it's like is you know we think Bitcoin's really really we, you know again from a crypto point of view everyone thinks well Bitcoin's better than gold but well you know but obviously a lot of people in gold think gold's still a superior asset so you know that's a that's an interesting thing you can trade you can then go and trade Bitcoin versus gold you know it's, you have to have a you know two accounts but that's it's all doable um, you know and, and it's a really uh, th- these are the things I think where where people uh, lose sight sometimes in trading it's, it can you know it doesn't have to be one thing it can be many things to many people um, and yeah I think it's I, 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 that's why I encourage people to, to uh, experiment because you've got to find what you like you know and it should become pretty obvious that's the other thing I'd say as well if you if you have been in the game for 12 to 24 months and you've tried a few things and you can't say any of them work for you, well, again, it comes back to that point. You probably, it probably just isn't going to work for you full stop. Um, so, you know, but yeah. I mean, it's, and then you get periods like this. I mean, the market at the moment is boring as batshit. Nothing's happening. <laughs> the, uh, the other reality of it is that, to be honest, if, if, you, if trading is not for you, if you put the same amount of effort required for you to be a successful trader into whatever career that is actually suited for you, mm. 
probably make the same amount of money doing that. Yeah. Or at least you you that de- yeah. that. If you did that kind of dedication, but that's, exactly. what it, that's what it is. It is. It's dedication. It's not. Yeah. I, unfortunately, there's no, there's no way I can tell you tomorrow you're going to be rich by just doing this. I, nobody has that silver bullet. As Jake was saying, there's going to be a lot of people telling you that they will give you that secret. Anybody saying that is just a blatant. I mean, anybody where the market is going is either crazy or a liar. That's nobody mm-hmm. knows. It could dump to 3,000 right now. It can go up to 11,000. It can, it can flatten out at 10,000 for the rest of it. It's like no one. We can make a calculated guess. We can predict. But nobody knows. It can do whatever it wants at the end of the day. That's just how markets work. And yeah, I mean... Most of all, don't, don't mortgage your house and go all in while you're learning. That's not yeah. something to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, pretty fair. Trade, uh, yeah. Trade with what you can afford to lose. Trading is fun. Very exciting. Yeah. I personally enjoyed it. And once it gets profitable, it's even more fun. But yeah, just, I guess be safe out there. That's, and remember to learn to manage your risk. That's the most important lesson. Manage yeah. your risk, position sizing. That's yeah. <laughs> Any, anything to show? Anything to show? Uh, just uh, lately, I mean, RSR, I've just been buying that every time it dips. Yeah. Uh, the only reason I haven't been selling it, but that's investing, not even trading, because it's not on any proper exchange. It's yeah. only on DEXs, so it's easier to buy on a DEX than to sell. Too much yeah. slippage <laughs> if I sell. So just keep buying RSR until it gets listed on proper exchange. REN, I'm liking that. Ren, uh, yeah. Apparently, it's the heart of that DeFi stuff. So, yeah. Might as well be bull- bullish on it. Yep. Uh, I'm becoming a little bit of a link bug thanks to Duncan. <laughs> I'm accumulating my bags now. I feel like they're actually going into bags hidden right now off the exchanges. Just, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is the stash. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, not anything you've been seeing lately that's specifically interesting? No, no, I think it's, it's, it's as you said, um, mm. you know, those DeFi names are going to be interesting. Uh, I, th- I think I think the, the interesting thing would be if we got a got a really big sell off, whether or not that puts stress on those DeFi pools. That's, I think that would be really interesting. Um, and if that happens and some of those names really really drop hard, that would be. I mean, you looked saw it in March, right? If you if you are if you were not in SNX and it traded back down to forty cents, now it's two bucks. Like yeah. that was you know that was the opportunity to, to step into those names um, there. But if again. A similar move type move happens, you know, you gotta be you wanna be ready to, to sort of probably buy buy those names at the moment. Um, what, it's, 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 I mean polka dot is we're still waiting for that to really kick off. Um, you know, which will be interesting. I think for for those who are guys who are really interested in staking, it's really interesting because it's got about four, I think three three or four different ways you can stake and Various types of nodes you can run, so you know it, it's quite an interesting project there. Um, and, and I think I think the big one will be still is, is I think I was talking to a guy today. I was actually last night. Sorry about it. It was a you know um, development of you know atomic swaps and, and things like that will continue to happen, which obviously will have then you know significant impact for the way that some of these other smaller chains potentially trade. It's probably bullish for them. You know, for something like a Cosmos, etc., like where it's on its own chain, it's you know people would like you know to trade against BTC at the moment. It's a you know it's an artificial pair. Uh, but yeah, I mean, other than that, it's I think it's just you know we're going. I think as I said we you know we said we're going to a quiet period of the time of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. So yeah, I don't. I think we might be a bit quiet. But, you know, for COVID, I think obviously the big thing is this COVID kicks off in the US again. Um, that's the real unknown. I mean, in terms of bags, what you said earlier, that I haven't really been accumulating anything just because I'm scared of Bitcoin dumping and then everything's going to dump with it. I'd rather yeah. buy then. I'm kind of waiting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And July, July historically, anyway, without, it already looks like it's going to fall off a cliff, but July historically has been a bad month for Bitcoin. Yeah. Generally, July is a bad month for Bitcoin. So yeah. Really, yeah, so I, mean, I, I, know, we, 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 I think, I think we've, to be honest, it's it's also let's be really frank. Like people are people are tired, people are fatigued. It's been the craziest six months to start a year for most people. Probably, well, so probably since yep. two thousand nine, right? You know, two thousand eight and two thousand nine. That first couple of months was pretty crazy for most people. 
So what? Yeah, for the last eleven years, this has been the the, the most hectic, extremely stressful, extremely uncertain period of their life, or, or the you know they're younger. You know, if you're you think about that, if that happened eleven years ago, if you were, you know, if you're thirty or younger, you basically probably didn't really have to care about what so much was happening in two thousand and nine. So, you know, for a lot of people out there, this would be the biggest, you know, life challenge I've faced. So I think I think you're seeing that. I think that's why you know seeing equity markets start to do nothing and stuff like, you know, Bitcoin do nothing is people are probably taking a bit of a breather and figuring out, you know, what they're gonna do. Yeah. If, if she hits a fan again, because that's the other thing. This is an interesting thing, right? When when the move came in March, was it was still taking everyone by surprise. But whereas if now, if a move comes, everyone's going to be thinking, "Oh shit!" You know, you, you just sell blindly. You know, so we'll probably it'll be the market will trade completely differently. If we so say if we've got a lot of more cases and say there's a you know concerns in August, all of a sudden the market will look completely different. It'll trade in different patterns, in different ways because everyone will keep second guessing, thinking what happened in March. I'll try to apply to what happened in August, and and markets are really smart at figuring that out. No, yeah, definitely. That's yeah. You always always need to be prepared for worst case scenario. No, it's it's actually good to take a break sometimes. Just. Don't don't need to always be trading. You can no, you no. Know. I mean, I know guys who 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 trade full time, and within a year, any one year, they'll take ten to sixteen weeks off. And not that's not necessarily planned. It will be that they will walk in the office on a Monday. It it's not been doing anything. It doesn't look like it's going to do anything. So they'll just go. Well, I'm going to take the rest of the week off, and they'll keep a I'll keep an eye on the charts. And if some big thing happens, they'll they'll run back to the office, but. You know, they'll just have the week off and then we'll see what happens. It's good for you. It helps you with your mental health and you need to be mm. the top. You need to be at the top of your mental health if you want to be a good trader. You can't, you can't be sitting there anxious and stressed and depressed and yeah. thinking you're going to be a good trader. You need to be actually clear-minded. You need to be focused. You need to be happy, yeah. energized, motivated. That's And that's it. So motivation is a really interesting one, right? Again, you know, people, there's all that you know, you sh- the shit you hear, why do people, you know, you make money, then you lose money, right? Well, yeah, it's, it's oftentimes, yeah, you get greedy, you, you oversize, you start trading too big, but you also do lose some motivation. If, you're, if you've just had a good run and you have, say, you know, hit your personal target, which might have been to, to double, your sta- you know, double your stack or start getting or sloppy. get a thousand link or whatever it was and you get there, Oftentimes you're like, well, fuck, I've lost my motivation because you, you, you've, you've finished your goal and you haven't moved to the new goal yet. You're still probably setting the goal. Yep. Um, and, yeah, you're not focused. You're not going to be that – you don't have that same hunger that you had when you first started, which, again, I think is an important thing in trading is, is you know, whether or not – you know, it depends on you as a person on how you want to set your goals, but I think, you know, you always got to have something that you're trying to hit, that you're trying to work towards. And for some guys it's really – granular like i used to work with guys one guy particularly he basically stuck to his daily goal was his thing and he knew that if he hit his daily goal every day he hit his monthly goal and he hit his yearly goal and it was a pretty substantial it wasn't they weren't small goals like if he if he did it right he was gonna take home six seven hundred eight hundred thousand dollars which is obviously nothing to sneeze at but it was the way he wanted to do it was to do on a daily basis he you know, he figured out that he could make five hundred bucks on this market, a thousand bucks on that market, and blah blah blah. And that's pretty stuck to that, like pretty hardcore. And that and that really worked for him really well. You know, for other people, it's like, well, you know what? Over this month, if I can make you know ten percent of my account balance, I'll be really really happy. Which is that sort of the month, right? Um, oh, yeah. you no, know, and and that's that's for them. And, and then if they hit it within the first two three weeks, well, then it becomes the challenge of do you you shut your positions and take them in or do you keep going? You know, that's, that's experience. You, you, you figure that stuff out. But, um, yeah, I think at the moment, yeah, you're probably best. If you don't have positions on, you know, just watch the charts, stay out and, and let it unfold. Yeah, the, there is no good risk-reward ratio oh, I think I'll give it right now. There actually isn't. You either need to wait for it to get 
up more so you can actually short it, or you need to wait for it to drop more so you can actually long it. There's trying to do anything here. Yeah. You're gonna sit there watching your balance just go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're better off just. All right, um, let it get along, then we'll we'll call it wraps. Yeah. So yeah, done. Let's call it off. Thanks everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, enjoyed it. Thanks, Grant. Uh, Thank yeah. You. Follow us on Twitter, follow Mind Digital. You'll get the video of this, get updated with Whiskey and Wix. And yeah, for you guys in Australia, don't forget to sign up with us on Mind Digital. Uh, rolling out a few interesting products, crypto yeah. and a few other things. Yeah. So yeah, follow us, stay updated, and let us know if you need anything. Will do. Speak soon, guys. <laughs> Take care, guys. Yes.